All right. Cool. So uh, my name is Chris Fox, and I think I know most of you in here now, and um, I work here at UC Irvine where we direct the ultrasound program. And I'm going to give a talk at noon basically with our experience here from soup to nuts. This is a talk now to really focused on how do we assess our medical students and um, how they, you know, who gets honors, who gets remediated, and how do we figure that out? How do we be the judge? So, you know, when it comes to assessment, the goal here, the overall, the overarching goal is really um, to try to figure out some direction here with the students who need to be directed or redirected and then try to find out wh what are the goals for future learning and it's not just their knowledge obviously but the skills and that's really important with um, with ultrasound is it's a really there's a there's a didactical component to it but there's also it's a really hands-on skill set as we all know things can change when you put probe to patient and that's what we need to also test and then when you integrate that in to the patient's bedside experience. It's easy to let technology get in the way of the doctor-patient relationship, and I think one of the major goals here as we assess our students with their use of ultrasound is to make sure that they're ushering it in in a professional way where the student does, I mean, the patient doesn't feel sort of left out of the equation. And so that's, that's, that's hard to do, to teach the knowledge, the skills, and the professionalism all at once, and then how do we assess that? Um, you know, when you look at what the goals are, our goals as educators is to protect the public, ultimately, seems a bit lofty at times, but that's really the ultimate goal is to make sure that, um, that, uh, that we self-regulate, we teach our students to self-regulate, and we also protect the public. And then, at some point, we're trying to decide, and students kind of help us with this, but which students uh, re need remediation and which ones need the opposite. They need the advanced training, the ones that are really gonna be the next leaders with this. And there's an article by Ron Epstein in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine talks about assessment in medical education. It was published a long time ago in 2007, but there's a lot of good messages in here. And this was an assessment of ultrasound medical education. This was just medical education in general. And the ways to measure competency basically boil down to a written examination, uh, an observed structured clinical examination, or OSCE, simulation, uh, 360 assessments and portfolios and all of this relates to ultrasound this is from that article but really all of these ways uh, that that stem throughout medical education can be applied to ultrasound in medical education very easily and so I'll talk first about the written examinations and it's you know there's um, a multiple choice test where you have a lot of questions various content short period of time super easy to grade this is a really convenient way to assess people, definitely. Um, but if you want to make these questions really rich in media and content with videos and arrows and stars that come up and subtleties there, then they can take a, a quite a bit of work to get prepared. But it's nice, once you've got that question bank, you can rotate those questions and use them uh, in perpetuity. They work really well. One of the downsides, though, to written examinations is that it encourages premature closure, meaning um, you get to a decision sometimes when you're going through the multiple choices, you, you, you jump on a choice before you um, consider all the possible diagnostic possibilities. And if you look at that premature closure, I mean, we're all guilty of it all over medicine. When, we're, when a patient's talking to us about what their problem, you know, we're trying to figure out what's wrong with them. It's really good to quickly, but assess a, a more of a broad differential diagnosis. So some of the, one of the problems with these written exams is that you can have that limitation. So this is an example of some of the um, very simple media case that we'd have here. Which transducer should be used to image the heart? And then you have your, your options there. And that's a very simple like MS1 question to ask. And when you find that somebody is using the linear probe to look at the heart, you immediately know there's a giant knowledge gaposis right there that you need to jump on before it becomes a gaposis knowledgeoma. And so, um, so, we, we, so that's a, it's, it's a simple question, but interestingly, there's gonna be somebody that misses it and you can get to them. Then you can go a little more advanced, right? And you can, with this image here, um, you're not only testing what view of the heart this is, but you're testing um, what the, which, of the, which of the valves, and then you're testing the physics of Doppler and how the you know red is flowing uh, one direction, blue is flowing the other, and then you're testing what the pathology is. So this is a much higher level question that um, can weed out 
you know, more of an advanced crowd and, and, and so that they really understand so many different things happening in this image. Again, this is a knowledge question, not a skill question or professionalism's question, but it still really gets at the knowledge. So if you have people, if the whole class misses this question, you know you need to do a better job at showing them what mitral valve regurgitation is and also what, how color flow Doppler works. And then again, this is another example of, it's a media question. You've got a video looping in the question. You know, we've, we've, we've covered up the patient identification information, so it's, you know, it's, uh, it's HIPAA compliant and everything, but it shows an example of appendicitis. And somebody looking at this image might think it's the duodenum, not a bad choice, because the duodenum and the appendix, it's sort of the same continuation of that same organ. It's the hypochoic outer wall, but at the same time, if you look around, you might see the psoas and some abdominal muscles and a blind ended tube that doesn't compress with um, some greater compression there, and you can confirm this is appendicitis. Though, it, again, it gets at that MS2 level pathology-based question, um, and I also can repurpose questions like this when I'm testing my surgery residents in ultrasound or my surgeons in ultrasound. Uh, this is a nice longitudinal um, utility here. So you might think you're making a question for a medical student when it turns out you're really making a question for all levels of learners, especially with some of these more advanced ones. So what about the obstructive, the objective structured clinical examination, or OSCE? And uh, embarrassingly, I didn't even know what an OSCE was probably five years ago. And um, as I delved more into ultrasound medical education and how we're going to assess everybody, this OSCE thing became really uh, exciting and fun. And it's basically a practical examination. It's a way to test to see if not only um, are they able to understand the knowledge, but also apply the skill. And then there's the professionalism component in there as well. So we have sterilized patients like all of you do, and they come and they participate in these OSCEs. And um, they're very good actors. We have a STEM question STEM for them, and they played out really well. And then um, we, they, they have time stations. They get to be able to complete the OSCE within a set period of time. Uh, sometimes it's 10 minutes, sometimes it's 15 minutes. Each one gets focused on a different task of ultrasound. And we've been, um, as, as you probably know, that this, these OSCEs have been part of the USMLE clinical skills, uh, the test that virtually all students pass, but is important uh, marker of um, when someone doesn't pass one, it's really scary. But, but that's been part of what we're doing with the USMLE for over 10 years. And the, the faculty member, you know, they're standing with their checkboard and they're observing and they have a checklist to make sure they're going through them. One of the nice things about these OSCEs, we record them. On the second floor of this building, we record all these OSCEs and they get, and the video gets recorded so I can go back and see why it is a student missed something with some of the communication professionalism's issue. And then when it comes to the, the, the actual skill of ultrasound, I can see where their hand is and all their ultrasound videos get saved so I can go back and find out what images they thought were important to record during their OSCE and make a decision about whether they need to be remediated or they're doing so well that I'm gonna, they're gonna be on my radar for an instructor downstream. When it comes to the physical examination, many of us uh, are one of the big barriers, the elephant in the room, if you will, and I just experienced this very recently, about two weeks ago, talking to another medical school here in Southern California. There was one person who was really concerned that students are going to lose the ability to perform a physical examination when the electricity runs out on an ultrasound machine. And, um, and, in, and wanted to show, they wanted me to show them the evidence right there and then that ultrasound uh, makes us all better doctors. And that these students, once they learn ultrasound, once they're out of, through all their training and working in a clinic, that they are going to be a better doctor. And of course, we don't have that data yet. Someday we will, but right now we're, we're sort of, we, we know that ultrasound, for sure though, is better than physical examination. You can beat up the physical examination all day long with ultrasound. It becomes, it takes a lifetime to become a master with the physical examination, to become a William Osler. It, it takes a medical school training to become a master at ultrasound. So I think that, that that will get you more accurate. It'll make you a better doctor. To study it, to prove it is tough to do, but, um, but, but we don't not teach the physical examination. We, of course, we embody the laying on of the hands and the, the traditional, the time-honored approach to taking care of our patients here. And, and, and it's just, we're not at a time really yet to say no more physical examination, just do an ultrasound. I don't think we'll ever be at that time, but at the same time, I think that the work that V. Din did, looking briefly at students before and after getting ultrasound implementation, and you can see that the, um, the various physical examination modalities here, rest assured, were not 
weakening the student's ability to perform a physical examination, we're actually making them a little bit better on their physical exam OSCEs after they've had their ultrasound curriculum. In fact, when it comes to taking blood pressures, examining the abdomen, and being professional, there's a statistical significant difference in VDIN study when it came to perform students who got ultrasound in their curriculum and how well they did performing the physical exam on an OSCE. So these were physical exam OSCEs and they did better after they had ultrasound implementation. So we're not getting weaker with the physical exam. If anything, you know, we're bolstering our skills there. And it makes sense, too, when you think about how you use ultrasound um, at the point of care. But it's on us, their faculty, to make sure that students don't lose the human touch with their patients. Okay, so when I perform an ultrasound at the point of care, I explain what I'm doing to the, with, with the patient. And I, I lay my hands on them, I lay the probe on them, and it's the, the gel and the sound that brings us together, and I show them their pathology right there at the bedside, or their normal organs. And we have that discussion, and, and they remember me. I mean, you know, I'm an ER doctor. I, I don't have a longitudinal thing with my patients, but they come back to the ER, and they remember me, the guy that looks like Phil Collins, who did an ultrasound on them, and I'm looking at them like I've never seen them before, and, but they remember that I'm the guy that did the ultrasound on them. And so we would made that, it, it, it makes me think that there must be something going on here with the doctor, me, and the, and, I mean the doctor, the patient, and the ultrasound, when they remember me, their ER doctor. So what are some other OSCEs that are going on? Uh, Dr. Hupman and the University of Southern California, uh, University of South Carolina, I keep saying that, um, did a great job at uh, publishing their curriculum, their four-year experience. They called it IUSC. And one of the things in their article were their beautiful OSCEs. And so um, they mentioned all M1 and M2 students undergo this OSCE. Each student has 15 minutes to perform a series of scans on a sterilized patient. There's a faculty member observing them and then completing an evaluation form. And they graded their interaction with the SP, all of that communication skills goes in there, making sure they, they had attention to modesty, patient modesty and that they're correctly also identifying the anatomical structures. I mean, you're really functioning on all cylinders when you're performing an ultrasound. You're trying to get the images on the screen, you're trying to usher this thing in with the doctor-patient relationship, and then you're making a decision about the images, whether they're normal or not, and then you're integrating that into why the patient's complaining of whatever the heck they're complaining of. And so that's why ultrasound can be tough to do, and it's important to integrate it early, and these OSCEs really get at all of those abilities, and they did really well. The M1s and M2s, their mean class score is 97.4%. And they also then went on to the third year and they integrated into the internal medicine rotation. They had an OSCE there looking at the thyroid nodules, somebody coming in complaining of a lump in their neck. Their standardized patient had a large thyroid cyst. Uh, we can find all kinds of standardized patients with thyroid cysts. They're readily available. That's what's nice about the thyroid. Um, and the students expected to find and measure it. They also have a central line OSCE and how this student in this OSCE prepared the consent and got ready to put the IJ in. Um, they have a family medicine OSCE where they do a AAA scan, an elderly patient. There's an OBGYN OSCE with a 27-week pregnant woman uh, to determine how many uh, fetuses she has in there, the heart rate, the placental location, and the fetal position. They do a surgical OSCE. Uh, the students demonstrate a fast exam on a standardized patient, and they do a pediatric Pediatrics OSCE looking for dehydration with the aorto, uh, aortic IVC ratio. And this is what their forms look like, and this is what a lot of OSCE forms look like. I have them here for you just to kind of show you what one looks like. It's sort of an Excel file where you make a bunch of shaded sh uh, cells, and you have the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, pelvic, echo, in the windows, the neck and the windows, and some other miscellaneous observations, like did the student introduce themselves? Were they attentive to this patient's comfort and modesty? Were they able to select and change the probes for each specific examination type? Really important moves there at the bedside that you can assess with an OSCE. So uh, they're doing a great job down there at the University of South Carolina. And this was um, an OSCE, just some other examples of OSCEs I have for you that have been published in the literature. This was an OSCE looking at um, a physician performance of the FAST exam. 82 doctors took a FAST course, and there was a written exam that went, that got at their factual knowledge, and then they did a videotape of real-time ultrasound examinations, and then assessed their ability to interpret these exams before and after the FAST course, and they had, you can measure that improvement with a post-course OSCE. Um, both on their factual and their interpretation skills, and they really felt that that 
um, was helpful to have a specifically designed OSCE for that. Uh, Dr. David Boehner here in the audience at The Ohio State University, he loves uh, uh, all his little uh, anachronisms like uh, be quiet is a really good one here. Brightness mode quality ultrasound imaging examination technique, it's basically an OSCE where you identify uh, and, and you have orientation categories as a technical category and then an image anatomy category and then um, and, they, and they define uh, all of their Likert explanations here, their numeric are all defined there under those various categories. And um, all of this is available uh, by, with, we, put, we put all this up on the AIUM uh, portal, web portal, so you can get to all these, that, that information pretty easily. And, and as you develop your own OSCEs, I think it's important to sort of give back to our community and, and, and put that up on the AIUM portal as well. We can help you do that. Um, this was one um, uh, in, in Germany looking at quality control of sonography courses um, in advanced training of physicians. Basically, what they did was they used OSCE criteria to evaluate all these different courses at different institutions uh, in a big region. And, um, and they saw that if, when, when people went to the hands-on component, if this was unstructured, they had a lot of deficits, deficits there in learning and people kind of were absent, they just left if there, if there wasn't, if these, if these hands-on sessions weren't run correctly. And they saw all this uh, emerge on their OSC, in, throughout their OSCEs. And so they said it's really important when you get to small groups to have very specific objectives and have instructors there to make, to usher everybody through these objectives or they're going to really suck on their OSCEs basically. And um, this was another um, a group here. Uh, using OSCEs to determine whether or not you could learn ultrasound in sort of a flipped classroom way. What that means is instead of live lectures, can you get the content via web or e-learning uh, and podcasts and things like that. And they said, and, and study after study after study shows that as, as long as you can show up to live hands-on scanning with good proctoring, um, that the content, the didactic content can come uh, from all kinds of different electronic sources. And so that's, that's really important when it comes to to really uh, wedging this into your curriculum is flipping the classroom so you're not taking up classroom time with somebody like me yammering along to people like you sitting in an audience not doing something with your hands. And so um, there's that. And uh, Dr. Uh, Ampanza um, also does a lot of work with medical student ultrasound, uh, basically took 307 uh, medical students and taught them cardiovascular abdominal ultrasound with um, you know, SPs and everything, and they, they gave them an OSCE exam during the physical diagnosis final examination, and um, they, they were able to judge where they needed to, to bolster their curriculum. So they did really well with the internal jugular vein, but their lowest scores with a FAST exam, and that's so helpful to know where the holes are in your curriculum and how you're teaching it, and that's really how we use our OSCEs as well. And this was from the uh, German Society of Ultrasound and Medicine. They do a lot of good work with, uh, they teach medical s ultrasound in medical education. Uh, they've been doing it for a very long time, and um, they, they looked at um, their, their uh, they called the DIGUM standards at Munster University there, and they do their own OSCEs called ADOPS, which is a direct observation of procedural skills, aka OSCE, and, um, and they, it's the same kind of thing, and they have this form here, and you can see, can you measure the organ, the structures, um, perform some measurements there, describe the procedure, the background, and of course, they have on there, and this is all translated, but they have on their communication skills as well as an important part of all of these OSCEs. So our OSCEs are kind of similar. I just took a screenshot. I'll just give you an example here. This guy, John Doe, 22-year-old male involved in a motorcycle accident. He was going 60 miles an hour on the freeway, was clipped by a car. He lays his bike down. He gets run over by another car. He's wearing a helmet um, and full leather motorcycle apparel. Upon arrival, the paramedics found him to be awake, alert, oriented, but complaining of abdominal pain and shortness of breath. And the physical exam is all scribed out for you there. And really what we want the students to do is take time, read the stem, and then get to the ultrasound component to try to find out what's going on there. So that's, that's, that's one of our OSCEs. We have another OSCE here. This is a female, basically comes in. Um, we have various cases for gallstones, renal stones, appendicitis. This one happens to be... Um, she, instead of eating hamburger bun, she substituted two Krispy Kreme donuts, immediately um, started having this, you know, epigastric wrapper quadrant pain, 7 out of 10, colicky in nature. How, what are you gonna, how are you going to use your ultrasound machine to get to the diagnosis here? So we, um, we, we have sterilized patients. Some of them have gallstones, and so it's nice, and we can 
train them into a really good uh, biliary colic uh, physical examination, uh, and history and physical examination, and then when it comes to the ultrasound, the student can actually pick up the, the, the gallstone there on that patient. Now, if we don't have that, I'll show you in a, in a minute here how we can simulate that. So there's really three ways to simulate if you want to break it down. One way is with a task trainer with a gelatinous simulated pathology inside of it. That's like a, a single little cube of gel and you're sticking a needle into it or you're trying to find something in it. Another way is a computer generated pathology. So you the computer has software in it that's programmed to, to make stuff look like pathology on ultrasound. And the third way is you take a patient, an actual volume from a real patient, and you sort of reverse engineer it so that when you move the probe, it makes the volume respond from a real patient. So this is what a task trainer looks like. And you can see that um, there's a student here trying to insert a central line into this patient's um, internal jugular vein and this is a, a gel mold uh, luckily for this patient we're doing it in the um, in-plane technique and we're trying to explain um, using this uh, ultrasound uh, task trainer simulator and then um, we, ca we can't find the needle oops here it is it's not even anywhere near the vein now this happened in real life and we're actually doing this on a real patient and you know air starts coming back in the syringe you got to ask yourself you know what the heck are you doing allowing this medical student to practice this on a real patient and then pat them on the back when they get the uh, pneumothorax. But with simulation, though, we can make sure that doesn't happen. We can make sure that, well, when it does happen, it's on a gelatinous mold and that they get it right over and over again until they really get the sense of what it's like to guide a needle tip down to a target and avoid um, important structures. And so, you know, one company, Blue Phantom, makes a whole bunch of these uh, simulation devices and they are not cheap. But sometimes you get a donor come along and they say, hey, do you have anything around 6,000 bucks that I could donate to the, and, and then I always jump on that right away. And uh, Nora, and we'll talk about it next session here, my sonographer and Brenda, they will immediately say, hey, we really need this simulation device next. And I, I hook those two things up and done. So this is a nice place for donors to kind of jump in at a low, you know, low price range. You know, not a whole institute, but maybe some simulation devices. Um, this is us just showing how we do a lot of uh, courses here, my faculty and everybody getting involved helping teach. Um, this was a, a, a phantom, like a homemade phantom made from, uh, with a piece of spaghetti to simulate a nerve with a starch core embedded in gelatin. And then they found that there was time to successful injection improved um, after five trials of doing this and uh, with 50% maximum quality after 3.6 trials and they plateaued after 8.5 trials. So you can take these things and you know, create research projects around them and, and publish it. Um, so this was, uh, they were doing this here in uh, Anesthesia Journal. This is another- The biomedic system Whoa. includes a realistic mannequin, a split screen monitor with both standard so ultrasound views Vimedics. and 3D so animated this is images. Simulated pathology with more than like. 50 pathologies. And there's cases Vimedics in there that they can go through. Vimedics exposes learners to a and, wide spectrum um, of patient cases. Vimedics is the only ultrasound now. simulator that offers the transthoracic and transesophageal modalities and fast and focus exams on one learning platform. So that's one, and this is another one here, this is Heartworks. The heart, we have all these the here. Simulated output on the ultrasound panel. Now this, this is really output nice for is TEE. generated in real time from our cardiac model. So you're wondering why would I teach a second year medical student transesophageal echocardiography? And it will show the corresponding I mean, this is image. why. You can show this, this is, you can show them I the anatomy and the physiology so well here. The plane of the ultrasound not that they're going to run out and do a TE to tomorrow, exactly how unless you're deed in, but they would definitely um, learn how this whole thing comes together um, anatomically, and what the grayscale ultrasound can look like as well. So we, we have them run through a little bit on this TE simulator when they're doing their cardiac stuff in their second year. I'd like, next like to show you the demonstration of This is Ultra the Sim. The this is another um, is simulation device. We don't have this. I don't actually have any familiarity with this here. Within the top of it is a 3.5 megahertz probe. We also offer a 5.0 so have various transducers there. Um, and a 7.5 linear ultrasound probe. The system helps I think originally some of these simulation devices were designed system. for um, like sonography schools. And so for sonography schools to get to get some of I think that's where Ultrasim first came along. Um, for uh, the community college sonography schools and stuff. This is um, Shawware, another company. It's, um, you can see they use some uh, patient-generated pathology as well in some of their work. 
I don't, I'm not familiar. Metaphor is another company that does simulation. That replicates the ultrasound image that you would see if you're actually scanning the patient in real time as you move the probe from the haptic device inside. They the have an endocavitary transducer. Secondly, it breaks down all the key parts of the learning. We process. use this a lot at our Sono games, Sono Easy Wars, lessons, ultrasound competitions. Replicates the teacher. Where I see this a lot. Such that it's to the trainee, it's as if the teacher was standing beside them and taking them through a educational lesson in how to do. Sound this is Sonosim. As you rotate the handheld Sonosim sensor, a virtual probe on screen precisely mirrors your sensor motion, and a corresponding ultrasound image is displayed in real time. By removing layers of skin and anatomy, you can visualize the array beam and correlate ultrasound images with underlying anatomical structures. View buttons provide probe positioning assistance, and findings videos deliver expert clinical analysis. And so we, we actually do utilize um, Sonosim during uh, the OSCE where we need to find some pathology. Turn this down a little bit. You need to find some pathology. So we could put these stickers here on the patient, and maybe one of these stickers has pathology underneath it. And when we build that into the case, when they get to that part of the ultrasound, they can use the simulation to identify whether or not there's pathology there. So while I don't use this as a substitute for scanning a standardized patient or a live model, I definitely add this to the OSCE component when I want to get them thinking about where on the body would the gallstone be, would the AAA exactly be. I mean, they can see the normal stuff, but then when they can see the location, I put the sticker right where I think it's going to be. And then, um, and then they can find it that way. So we can, and it's because it's on a laptop, you can also use this in um, all different settings. And these are some of my students teaching other students with it. Now, what about um, when we um, integrate uh, ultrasound here at the bedside? This was a study that uh, Dr. Turner did with, um, with some other authors and looking at uh, doing a hands-on training and a, using a simulator and trying to see if the simulator learner group uh, did as well as people taught by experts and live models. And again, study after study shows that um, asynchronous learning or flipped classroom material use of simulation is a good substitute for actual live lectures and people standing in front of you trying to teach you. Um, what about multi-source 360 degree assessments? How can we use that in ultrasound? That's part of all of, the, all of these assessment articles. And when, you have, when you're being assessed by your peers, other members of the clinical team, and frankly, patients, um, you really get good insight into what your own work habits are like and how well you work in teams and what your interpersonal sensitivity is. And the standardized patients can really play a huge role here. And that's why we all use them so much. Uh, but, um, but when the trainees receive all these ratings and comments by their own peers that's confidential and given really timely, along with support to help them reflect on these uh, comments. I think that over and over again, the literature shows this is a powerful, insightful, and a very instructive way to uh, help assess them. So this is something uh, that we try to be better at working on. It takes time, but definitely giving people feedback. This m occurs, unfortunately, mostly in the remediation stages of our curriculum where people are failing OSCEs or people are, are failing or missing critical questions, not being able to do critical moves, or just offending the standardized patients in some way, then we definitely bring them in. Uh, but I think having them somehow, if you can work in the, the confidentiality issue, get them assessed by their peers, uh, work that into it in some small way, I think can really go a long way to, to help them. Because that's sort of what happens later in your, in your career anyways. There's a lot of peer review that goes on with M&M &M and all over the hospital. So I think that's important to introduce that early. And then I'm trying not to steal any any thunder here away from um, the, the people that are coming after me, but, uh, but the, there is a, an important concept of ultrasound portfolios. As in medicine, as in the visual arts, portfolios demonstrate a trainee's development and their technical capacity. Everything from chart notes to referral letters, procedural logs, videotape consultations, peer assessment, patient surveys, literature searches, quality improvement projects, all this stuff can be chucked into this uh, portfolio and it includes the self-assessments, learning plans, reflective essays, all of that with close mentoring is really helpful um, 
in, in sort of putting this into a nice construct for the student. But I really think ultrasound can, can be a, a huge part of this portfolio. When they graduate, and we talk about this all the time, how you operationalize is a whole other thing, right? But ideally, when the students graduate, if they had at least an ultrasound portfolio that I could then um, confer some kind of extra thing for them at graduation, and there's all kinds of words you could throw out that I wouldn't use, like certification or accreditation or credentialing, but all of that is a whole nother topic, but at least some kind of notation on their transcript that they graduated with honors and ultrasound, or they had this ultrasound portfolio that they gathered 2,000 images during medical school or more, and you know all of these were reviewed and feedback was given, and you know we confer on them this ability to perform point of care ultrasound. So at some point going forward, it would be nice to to sort of come up with what that minimum should be. I know we talk about it a lot at different conferences and small groups and stuff, but I think that's part of this uh, digital, uh, sonographic digital portfolio. This was um, a, a group that, that, would, that did this. They, um, they did a longitudinal image tracking program and student images were saved for basically two years. They saved 10,074 images, 1,200 videos during that two years, and uh, medical students are able to collate and document their ultrasound experience and demonstrate proficiency. So it's kind of a vague article, but I think it's really sort of on the right track here that if we could document that for our students, the way we do really in the graduate medical education programs with residents, you know, my residents get a, you know, I, I log all their studies and at, at any point in time I can tell them exactly how many gallbladders they've looked at. And so for, for us to have that as sort of the next stage, but how to do that is a whole nother story, which I'm gonna leave to, Doctors uh, Weekman and Dr. Yum later uh, in this in the session. So, but this is just one sort of a software that uh, Dr. Tierney developed uh, in his institution, where they were able to track their ultrasound education. You can see the users sort of pop up here, and you pick your name, and then you can um, select what study you were doing, and um, and then you start to develop, you know, your image bank. It starts to come up here. You start to gather those those little dashboards there of how well you're doing. So you could say, oh, I need to do a lot more, you know, GI ultrasounds or something. And so they're all, they're all right there. And, 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 and if there's a cool way to do this on, an, on a you know, handheld device would be really helpful for people to track down performance the way we have a lot of this portfolio stuff with our resident evaluations already. So, um, but yeah, that's basically um, what I got for you. Basically to uh, measure competency, you could start with a really nice written examination putting a lot of content into there, making it really sort of interactive that way. You can have fun with that, and it can be used, again, not just for medical students, but other, other specialties and residents. And there's OSCEs is the best way to, I think, assess not only somebody's knowledge, but their procedural skills, their ability to put probe to patient, and also identify pathology, and how they communicate with their patients. We use a lot of simulation to do that, and it would be great if we had more operationality around 360 assessments in portfolios. Any questions for me? Yes. Yeah, oh great, some comments, even better. Echo task trainers, okay. Yeah, scanning planes always give us uh, all um, a real tough time when we get started. I know for me, I'm not a very three-dimensional person, and I struggled so hard to understand why it was when I moved the, when I rotated the transducer, the image would, you know, go that direction and rotate, and I couldn't get it for the longest time. And I think my fellowship director was about ready to fire me. And but you know, finally, I it's it just dawned on me, you know, after just scanning a lot, you know, just punishing a lot of patients and finally understanding it. But it would have been so cool had I, 15 years ago, had something like that, um, a scan trainer, to really get my windows down before I put probe to patient. I think that would have helped me tremendously understand these, these various planes, especially when they're tied to other imaging. You know, when you see a CT in a coronal plane, and you get an ultrasound in a coronal plane, you're looking at the anatomical 
like drawing in a coronal plane and then you rotate and watch the whole thing flip to a sagittal plane, that's, I mean, there's a lot of knowledge that goes on there for all of us, not just medical students. That's a good point. Yeah, that is key. I like that. No, that's good. No, we have plenty of time. So that's a good point. We do dedicated ultrasound rounds, and on those rounds in internal medicine, on those rounds, a lot of the patients have interesting findings. The students present their cases to us before we go in there, and then we ush and then we, the faculty usher in the, the ultrasound examination with the patient. And you're absolutely right. Some of these patients just come to life, you know, like hey, somebody's paying attention to me, and they start just teaching. You know, and they become the real teacher right there at the scene, and and you're seeing beautiful examinations of valvular problems, all kinds of you know pathology all over the body. But we've been really fortunate that way, and I can't stress that enough to leverage actual, real patient experiences in the clinical years and third year of medical school is a wonderful time to do that. And we've got some people talking about that later, I think. So. Yeah, an actual patient like rounding OSCE. also the findings with the test because often you you can see how they perform and and if they can uh, make a window and everything but you cannot measure if they are interpreting the findings right interpreting their findings and then integrating them yeah exactly. you know so what the patient's got this one plus mitral valve regurgitation they're here for shortness of breath is that really what's causing their shortness of breath, or is it this other thing we're seeing in the lung? Yeah, yeah absolutely. That, that, that's, that's a big part of this. Yes? We actually had a sit-down experience when I was working at NYU where we had our students run through OSCEs, very standardized, very kind of clean white room, and they would do great. And those students were still on rotation with us in the emergency department, and then they would really struggle at first because now it gives a real human being who's like, God, I these in them, and has been pissed off because they're there for four hours. There was like a hesitancy, kind of, which I think is really great for them to experience and get over and learn how to negotiate that experience with the patient. So we altered our structure. We did not do any OSCEs in the sim center anymore. We just did our scanning and teaching time. Um, but then we would bring them right back to the ED as soon as possible so they could kind of reintegrate and make sense. 
Hmm. That's interesting. It reminds me of when we're doing ultrasound rounds at, and with internal medicine. When we enter the room, and many times the patients are pretty uncomfortable. And the first question we ask is, are, you know, what can we get for you? Do you need some more pain medication? And it's very different, you know, uh, sort of experience when you have to, okay, this guy in bed seven, he's going to get some pain medication. We're going to come back in a half an hour. We're going to go try this other one over here. So you kind of have to kind of take care of some of those patient comfort issues first. And that's so important for the, for the students to, to be part of all that because that's all part of this process. It's not just running in there and jamming the probe on. And as an emergency physician, I'm rounding in the rest of the hospital, up in the ICU and the medicine floors. I, I definitely have a different perspective on, on that now than I had before I started to do that. And I think it's important for us all to cross-pollinate a little bit as we, as we uh, teach this stuff. Other questions over here? Yes? Yes. Yeah. So that's a website right now. I think they're trying to make it into an app. And uh, I, I don't want to steal the thunder from, I think Dr. Yum is going to talk about it in a session. Where's the schedule? It's coming up. Um, yeah, how mobile technology facilitates learning and ultrasound aids in student portfolio workflow. I think they, they discussed that a little bit in that session. But I think right now it's not an app unless somebody knows differently. It's just a website that they, that they kind of homegrown made. But would be a great, it looks like an app, doesn't it? It would be a great app. Wish it was an app. Other questions? We need an app. Okay, thank you very much.